Hello Booktube, my name is Nathan, thank you so much for watching and welcome to my channel and welcome to Twilight Zone Tuesdays. There is uh, two different series that I'm doing with this. So the first one, then I'm going through 13 of my favorite Twilight Zone episodes from the original series. I'm talking about those episodes with my brother. And then the companion series, which is what you're watching right now, is the booktube version of it, in which I go through some of the original short stories that were then adapted into Twilight Zone episodes. So not all of them um, were, were short stories. In fact, the uh, I'm sure it's the majority uh, in, in, in the early seasons, and Rod Serling wrote most of the episodes of the Twilight Zone as original teleplays. But there's also still quite a few short stories that were ended up, um, that were then adapted into episodes on the Twilight Zone. And so what I'm looking at today is It's a Good Life by Jerome Bixby and Rod Serling, who is the narrator and creator of the Twilight Zone, he did the teleplay for this. So uh, this was first published in 1953 in Star Science Fiction Stories 2. And then it was turned into a Twilight Zone episode in, I think, 1961. Yeah, November 3rd, 1961, uh, starring Billy Moomy, Mommy, John Larch, and Cloris Leachman. And so in the other video that I do talk about that, that if you recognize the name Cloris Leachman but you can't place her, then just do a Google Images search and you'll recognize her. So it's a, a fairly young Cloris Leachman in the episode. So I have... Um, encountered this story before so first it is there is a, a simpsons halloween special um from fairly early on in the series which is where i first saw the story but i didn't know that it was a twilight zone episode and then when i was in university then i took a science fiction literature course and this short story is one of the ones that we looked at because it was published in the science fiction hall of fame from I think 1970, which is an anthology put together by Robert Silverberg. And so we talked about it. So I literally um, went through my old university notes with that binder and I found the notes that I took from however long ago, like 15 years ago on the short story to remind myself, like what did we talk about in class? And um, it was worth keeping them apparently, right? But this is not the first time that I've consulted my notes like this. So. Jerome Bixby, just an interesting thing about him as a writer, he went on, he was a sci-fi horror um, writer, but he also went on to write a number of episodes from the original Star Trek television series. So this short story itself in my edition, and this is a book that I have, um, Twilight Zone, the original stories. So like I say, most of the episodes were written by Rod Serling. But aside from that, then a lot of the other episodes that you get came from these short stories from mostly the 1950s and early 1960s that were then chosen for the show. And so in this edition of my book, it's about 21 pages in length. And it really closely, like the television episode really, really closely follows what happens in the short story you even get a little bit more detail in the short story than you do in the television episode with me doing this project. I've noticed sometimes the episodes got more detail, sometimes the short stories got more detail. Um, but in this case, then the short story does, it, give, it answers some questions. So if you've not already seen the episode, I do encourage you to go and watch that or read the short story. But I would say, I, you can do it in whatever order you want, but I think it's worth um, both reading and watching. Um, for It's a Good Life. And with this one, because a lot of the questions that I think most viewers will have when they're watching the episode are, well, why hasn't anybody, you know, gone after Anthony in some way? And then in the short story, you get the answer, oh yeah, a whole bunch of townspeople did, and then he just killed them all. So then everybody learned not to do this. And then as far as other children in town, um, you get an interesting little uh, backstory to this where none of the parents let their kids go anywhere near Anthony and then the kids in town as kids are wont to do came up with some kind of rumor he became this like mythological creature that like oh he's a gremlin but he looks like a boy so they dare one of their friends um, I think it's one or, or a couple of them to go and play with Anthony so then they do and then of course he ends up killing them so like like I say like the the short story has got more detail there and it's pretty disturbing 
Um, the, the short story is, in fact, in many ways more disturbing than the television episode, but the television episode definitely makes Anthony more malevolent than he appears to be in this. He actually comes across much more sympathetic in this, even though he's clearly a, a monstrous figure for the, the townspeople. He's incredibly dangerous, but he's not doing it out of malice. He's genuinely not, um, which is curious. So the other thing, too, is the episode of the series makes it unclear, then it's in the narration that Rod Serling gives, whether Anthony is, whether everyone else on Earth has just disappeared. He made them all disappear, or whether he took this small town of Peaksville, Ohio, and then brought it somewhere else. That doesn't really get resolved in this, but it's the second paragraph of the short story. Then it says, perspiring under the afternoon sun it like sun is in quotation marks bill lifted the box of groceries out of the big basket over the front wheel of the bike and came up the front walk so it's not the sun that he's moved them somewhere else seems to be the implication from that and then it also talks about the sunlight being a little off that it doesn't look like regular sunlight and so it's certainly there to me even though you still get this um, ambiguity within the short story, whether the rest of the earth, like whether he moved them or not, whether the rest of the earth is somewhere else. It sure seems, though, that they're not in the same dimension anymore or the same space in the universe, that they've moved and that it's not our sun. Uh, another thing, too, if you're wondering, as far as the population, in the short story, the population is 46. So you have that um so that's uh most of the stuff most of the details that you get in the short story that you don't get in um the tv episode but like i say anthony overall comes across much more sympathetic in this but he's still a terrifying terrifying creature as a result so this is um a few pages into the the story just to illustrate my point so it says, um, I'll just read this paragraph. Everybody in Peaksville always said, oh, fine, or good, or say, that's swell, when almost anything happened or was mentioned, even unhappy things like accidents or even deaths. They'd always say, good, because if they didn't try to cover up how they really felt, Anthony might overhear with his mind, and then nobody knew what might happen. Like the time Mrs. Kent's husband, Sam, had come walking back from the graveyard because Anthony liked Mrs. Kent and had heard her mourning. So you can see in the story, he's not doing it. He's not bringing back her dead husband to hurt her. It's not malice. He's genuinely trying to help because she's thinking like, I miss him so much. I wish he were back. So then Anthony's like, okay, and brings him back, but presumably not as a... um, not as he was before he died, right? Um, but as this, you know, grotesque thing from from the grave. So that's one example of this. You do have this really fascinating passage where it talks about his. Um, he's essentially created this oasis for the insects and small little animals in their town to come to. Um, And this is where he comes across as incredibly sympathetic, where he doesn't like the, he doesn't like the way people have all of these um, troubling thoughts in town and the way they feel about him at times. And, uh, but he loves being around, he loves being in nature and he loves the animals and he likes to take care of them. So he's got this little clearing in the cornfield and this is where he goes. There's um, It's a grove where a grove of shadowy uh, green trees covered cool, moist, dark ground and lots of leafy undergrowth. And it says, Here Anthony liked to rest and watch the birds and insects and small animals that rustled and scampered and chirped about. He liked to lie on the cool ground and look up through the moving greenness overhead and watch the insects flit in the hazy, soft sunbeams that stood like slanting, glowing bars between ground and treetops. 
Somehow he liked the thoughts of the little creatures in this place better than the thoughts outside. And while the thoughts he picked up here weren't very strong or very clear, he could get enough of them to know what the little creatures liked and wanted, and he spent a lot of time making the grove more like what they wanted it to be. The spring hadn't always been here, but one time he found thirst in one small furry mind, and it brought subterranean water to the surface in a clear, cold flow, and watched blinking as the creature drank, feeling its pleasure. Later he had made the pool when he found a small urge to swim. And then it goes on, so then more and more creatures start coming, and he just goes there and he kind of meditates and feels for their thoughts, and then says, oh, they want this, I'll provide them with this. Oh, they want some rocks, I'll give them rocks. Oh, they want to have, you know, um, like flowing water, I'll give them flowing water. Oh, they want to have food, I'll bring them food. And then what he does, and it's really interesting, is that um, he, it said, so it says like, every time there would be some kind of creature he had never seen before with new ones showing up, and he would find its mind and see what it wanted and then give it to it. And because animals are insects and animals essentially want very elemental things. They want things that are ultimately good for them. They want shelter, they want food, they want water, they want to be safe and protected from predators. These are all good things to provide. Human beings, however, if you follow this through, have got more complicated thoughts, more complicated desires. Sometimes we desire things that are ultimately not good for us. And in that way, this is where the story becomes really fascinating because you're saying, oh, so is the, the monstrous nature of Anthony the fact that we desire things that are ultimately bad for us? And if we actually were granted those things, it would be a nightmare scenario. So it's not so much that Anthony is evil, but perhaps our desires at time are evil. That's an interesting implication of it. Like it, it, it kind of turns it around and you don't get that in the TV episode. So there's that. And the other thing too is um, I'm trying to find the exact spot. So there is, yeah. So this is like really essential to understanding the, the short story where it says a long brown sleek furred animal was drinking at the pool Anthony found its mind next. The animal was thinking about a smaller creature that was scurrying along the ground on the other side of the pool, grubbing for insects. The little creature didn't know that it was in danger. The long brown animal finished drinking and tensed its legs to leap, and Anthony thought it into a grave in the cornfield. He didn't like those kinds of thoughts. They reminded him of the thoughts outside the grove. Um, and that's where you get into this whole um, backstory of people in town had those thoughts about him. So the interesting part of the, the story, and this is where I'm saying that Anthony comes across as being very sympathetic. Not only is he really kind to the animals and the insects in this grove, but then when there's a predator in the grove that wants to eat one of the other animals, and he goes, I recognize that thought. That's the thought that people had about me before. They wanted to kill me. Um, they wanted to uh, attack me and make me go away. And so that's why he just, you know, dispenses with that um, predator, right? Whatever it is, if it's a, you know, a fox or a coyote or, or whatever it happens to be, he just gets rid of it. And so the interesting thing, when you're looking at that thing, you say, so the only reason then that he's monstrous or monstrous is that he's ultimately protecting himself because people don't like him and they want to hurt him. And he's even trying to help them. He's trying to be nice to them and then they loathe him and fear him and don't want him alive because of his powers and so that's when he and they think these bad thoughts about him and he feels threatened so because he's got this complete omnipotence then he's then able to get rid of them entirely it it's interesting <laughs> because like I say in the in the TV show then it seems like there's a bit more malice in it than self-preservation right he gets angry at people not that he's scared for his own life but he doesn't like other people there's a couple other things though I, I that I want to point out so one of them is the television show like show that he puts on in the Twilight Zone episode, like there's a couple little things here. Um, 
and I guess I, I should point to some of the other things that we learned from the short story. So for one thing, as far as the edge of the town, there's just nothingness on the borders of it. Uh, so what they do, and like if they end up with too much crops, um, it, too big of a harvest, then what they do is they take the excess and then they just dump it off into the nothingness because otherwise it will spoil and the entire town will smell from the rot. And so you go, oh, like it's so, so this is where it's like, it's not really the, the sun, it's the sun. And they seem to be in a fairly enclosed space and you're not getting fresh air or something, right? That you have that. A another change that you have is when he attacks, um, I forget who it is. Is it um, Bill Soames, I want to say? And then he turns him into a, um, a jack in the box in the television episode just says that it's like just some unimaginable thing that nobody's ever seen before it's uh yeah it says i'm oh, sorry it's dan hollis that he does this too so bad man anthony said and thought dan hollis into something like nothing anyone would ever have believed possible and then he thought the thing into a grave deep deep in the cornfield so it doesn't say what he turns him into but it's awful right whatever it is it's awful but so getting back to the television thing so in the tv episode it's just dinosaurs right it's dinosaurs on television that are attacking each other and you can see even though like you look at it now in you know the 21st century and you look at um the the graphics let's say right the the um stop motion effects of these two dinosaurs hitting each other and it's not really disturbing for us but you see the reaction of everyone in the living room watching this and you can see that they're very upset by this the short story does such a better job though of what he puts on television and why it disturbs him so this is what it says they just sat silently and watched the twisting writhing shapes on the screen and listened to the sounds that came out of the speaker and none of them had any idea of what it was all about they never did it was always the same um, and then this is how the story ends. While Anthony sat on top of the set and made television, they sat around and mumbled and watched the meaningless flickering shapes far into the night. Like, <laughs> I think that's so much more disturbing. It's, what the hell is this? Like, what are we watching? These meaningless shapes, these sounds that make no sense, and it's always the same. Like, why is Anthony doing this? what is it that he's channeling what is he getting out of this where is he getting this idea from of these things that they haven't recognized before like to me it makes me shudder i, I feel like that's what <laughs> that's the appropriate response to this um so it's really i think that's far more upsetting than just i'm gonna make dinosaurs fight but of course how do you portray that on screen and this is where often i prefer literature to television or film because you get stuff like that where you can put it you could put a description like that to essentially say it's indescribable but then the second you try to portray it you know on in cinema then like on screen it just it doesn't work okay the there's just a few other things i wanted to go over so this is right towards the end of the short story this is another really creepy thing that you get it talks about when he was first born um, it did no good to wonder where they were, no good at all. Peaksville was just some place, some place away from the world. It was wherever it had been since that day three years ago when Anthony had crept from her womb and old Doc Bates, God rest him, had screamed and dropped him and tried to kill him and Anthony had whined and done the thing, had taken the village someplace or had destroyed the world and left only the village, nobody knew which. That description... Um, I want to read that again. So it was wherever it had been since that day three years ago when Anthony had crept from her womb and then old Doc Bates um, screamed, dropped him, and tried to kill him. Okay, crept from the womb is like the creepiest line I think Bixby could have possibly written. Like no baby should creep out of the womb clearly right like that shouldn't even <laughs> be necessary for me to say but then doc bates knows immediately something is incredibly wrong with this kid not just oh he's strong enough to crawl or whatever he screams drops him and tries to kill him even though anthony is supposed to be a little boy 
and looks like a little boy, although it talks about his purple gaze a lot. And is it, does he just have purple eyes or is there something else going on here? But the doctor knows immediately. And is it just the way he was moving when he came out of his mother's womb? Or is there something else to him that we don't get in the story? Um, I'm not sure which, but it's, it's really, really disturbing. Um, which is right up my alley. I love that kind of thing. But it, it really works for me. That <laughs> it's the effect that Bixby is going for. It's like, congratulations, you succeeded, because I'm definitely creeped out by this. So um, those are basically my notes. And I did want to mention some of the stuff that we talked about in my sci-fi literature course. So my professor, he he mentioned a few different things that work really well. So for one thing, he said that this is um, allegorical for the the nuclear age and that it, it's essentially living in this world of mutually assured destruction where one tiny mistake just just one just itty bitty tiny mistake can change everything right that if one person sets off one nuclear weapon and then living within a world of, new, uh, of mutually assured destruction, right? So whether it's the Soviets or the Americans who do this, it's just gonna be the end of everything, right? That's essentially it, that if you have one bad thought, it's gonna be the end of everything, right? <laughs> and um, so I, I like that idea that it, it's acting as an allegory for that, for, for Cold War tensions. And then he also mentioned a few different things that it kind of works on both sides. So in the United States, it works as an allegory for McCarthyism, where you have to be careful about what you're thinking and you can't have those bad thoughts and everybody's, um, you're, you're living in this incredibly suspicious world where everybody's like, you know, like, hey, that kind of sounds communist. Hey, what did you just say? What are, what are you thinking? Um, that kind of attitude. Uh, but then on the other side, then it works for people living within the Soviet Union. Uh, so within uh, like the Stalinist um, regime, that it's obey or you're just going to disappear. You're just going to be disappeared. If you start questioning things, if you start saying, this isn't good, this isn't a good society, this isn't a good system of government, I don't want to live this way, I don't like the people who are in charge, I don't like the structures that we have, then it's, uh, yeah, don't say that, don't say that, because you're just going to disappear somewhere, they're going to take you off and you're going to end up in Siberia or wherever else, and um, no one will ever see or hear from you again, which is essentially going to the cornfield. Right, so it works really well on both sides, right? McCarthyism and um, Stalinism. So that was one of the things that uh, my professor mentioned, which I thought was was a very good insight into this. And um, I think I think that's mostly what I wanted to talk about. Oh, the other thing too, and it is fairly interesting what you get in the story. The what they do in, in terms of like controlling their thoughts is in the short story, they basically, they'll just repeat things in their mind to try to essentially create static in their mind. So that way when Anthony reaches out and tries to see what they're thinking or feeling, he either won't be interested or he won't really probe to uh, too much further so like they'll just like do like the multiplication table you know or or an addition table right like two plus two is four you know four plus four is eight that kind of thing and they'll just repeat those things in their head um and uh so anyway it's kind of an interesting way of for them to mask what they're thinking because in the tv episode then you don't get that so much they just constantly say it's a good day it's a good day it's a good day but I think through that and I'm like, the short story makes more sense to try to come up with something else in your head and focus on it, kind of mindlessly repeating something to put that at the front of your mind. Because even if like, I mean, of course, we've all done this, we all experience this all the time, that if you fib in some way, then the truth is still there in your mind, right? That if somebody says, you know, like, oh, like, what do you think? Like, if you're at a dinner party, what do you think? Like, oh, the food's really good. And like, in your head, you're not thinking, the food's really good. The food's really good. You're going like, this is awful. 
right? So, like, in the TV episode, I don't know that it works as well with how is he not catching what they're really thinking? They could say it's a good day, but it's like, they're not thinking it's a good day. They're just saying it. They're f trying to get themselves to think that. But the short story was saying, this is how they are obfuscating what they're really thinking by doing that rote uh, memorization and just like repetition of these things that they've memorized that are essentially meaningless things to try to hide their thoughts, especially when they're near him. So that's mostly what I had to say about the short story. It's a really good one. It's really disturbing. Like it really holds up as, as being um, creepy and upsetting. But if that's your thing, and I imagine if you're interested in the Twilight Zone, then you know, you've know you got to at least somewhat enjoy that, then it is well worth reading if you have not read this before. All right, folks, if you have read it before, feel free to comment and like and subscribe, all of that stuff. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.